everybody. With Bob Christopher and Richard Piper, this is Basic Gospel, a media ministry dedicated to helping you hear, believe, and live the good news of Jesus Christ. Today, the continuation of our study through the Simple Gospel Simply Grace Study Guide. If you would like a copy of the study guide and the study notes as they are made available each week in advance of the study, visit basicgospel.net slash teaching. There you can order your copy of the Simple Gospel Simply Grace Study Guide and download the free notes each week. Again, that's at basicgospel.net slash teaching. It's Basic Gospel, everybody. Now to continue our study, here is Bob Christopher. Well, we certainly welcome you to today's broadcast. We're studying through the Simple Gospel Simply Grace Study mm-hmm. Guide. Today we're uh, taking up Chapter 7, From Fear to Faith. And I think this is one of the most important chapters uh, in the book because it really addresses uh, the fear that we have in our own hearts and takes a look at how that fear motivates us in our relationship with God. And when we really understand truth and the love of God that's been expressed to us in Jesus Christ, we can see that our relationship with God and how we respond to God can be motivated by something different. So we want our hearts to move from fear to faith, and that's what this chapter is all about. And I want to start out today telling a little story. A couple of years ago, uh, we were doing the broadcast, and uh, we were working through the forgiveness issue, and I think the subject of that particular day was Hebrews chapter 10, uh, the finished work of Jesus Christ, you know, that uh, God remembers our sins no more, and where these have been forgiven, there's no longer any sacrifice for sin. Well, as we talked about that, the phones lit up, and we went to the first caller, and it was a lady named Barbara, and, and from the very first words out of her mouth, you knew it yeah. was an argument about to take place. She was not happy at all with what we were saying, and she kept saying, isn't there something that we're supposed to do? Uh, I mean, I get that Jesus died on the cross, but that's not enough. There's something that we need to do. Mm -hmm. And that sounds logical. It sounds appropriate. Uh, You know, we all think we need to do something once we sin to get into God's good graces. But I think we need to take a look at the finished work of cross at the cross, and then we'll really see how we're to respond, what the appropriate response is. Mm -hmm. So as we work through this chapter, we're going to see some incredible passages that are going to tell us that our sins have been forgiven. There's nothing more that needs to be done. Now, like I said, from a human perspective, that doesn't sound right. Uh, We certainly think there's something more that needs to be done. But the New Testament has much to say about this. And as I mentioned, the overwhelming evidence will help move our hearts from fear to faith. So we're going to start out with a passage um, that we talked a lot about last week. It's John 19.30. And this is Jesus on the cross, his last words before he gave up his spirit and and committed it into the hands of his loving father. He said, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So what did Jesus cry from the cross? It is finished. It is finished. Well, what do you think these three words mean? Well, if you follow the asterisk and you see all of the footnotes on, underneath, it means it is finished. Nothing. It's done. Everything is done. That's right. The task that Jesus had been given had been completed uh, once and for all. There was nothing more to be done. Nothing. So everything that God had outlined for Jesus to do Mm -hmm. from the time of his birth to the time of his death was completed at that very moment. The sin issue had been dealt with once and for all. The blood had been shed. It had been offered up to God the Father. God the Father received it and was satisfied with it on our behalf. Our sins had been judged. Our sins had been condemned. Our sins had been punished. Period. Fine. End of story. Yeah. It's done. It's and, done. And why do we add the footnotes? Why do we say except for this and except for that and except for the other? If we'd come to grips with this, these three words, life would be different. Absolutely. So we get back to that passage that we were talking Mm -hmm. about when our friend Barbara called and was really up in arms. It was Hebrews 10, 17 
through 18, and it reads this way, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. So this is at the end of an argument Mm -hmm. that the writer of Hebrews is giving concerning the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It is better, superior in every way to the sacrifices of the Old Covenant. Uh, Those sacrifices were merely shadows. Those sacrifices could never take away sin. Those Those sacrifices could never make us perfect or holy. And here in Christ... Uh, our sins have been taken away mm-hmm. once and for all. They do, that sacrifice did make us holy. That sacrifice did bring us to perfection, to God's stated goal for us. So that sacrifice is superior. And then he comes up with this statement, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. So how does that passage explain Jesus's cry on the cross. And I think it does, don't oh, you? Oh, absolutely. It means there's never going to be another sacrifice for sin, ever. Jesus was the once and for all sacrifice. He once and for all time dealt with the sin problem. It's not a problem anymore, not between God and us. So there's absolutely nothing that we have to do to get more forgiveness or to get into God's good graces, or to get that black mark erased from our name? Is that what you're saying? That's, that's what I'm <laughs> saying. God took care of that. He initiated this to us. If you want to do something, respond to him and say thank you. Absolutely. That's, and, and what this verse is saying is that in this new covenant, there's actually no provision no. for a sin sacrifice. Yeah, there isn't. And there, there is absolutely none. So in the old covenant, uh, there was the day of atonement. So mm-hmm. once a year, the high priest took blood, uh, first the blood of a bull for his own sins, and then the blood of a goat for the sins of the people. Mm-hmm. And there was a very elaborate process that the high priest went through uh, so that those sins could be taken care of for that previous year. Yeah. Um, but on top of that one, that annual sacrifice, folks could bring animals to be sacrificed on a daily basis, Mm -hmm. but they were always bringing sacrifices. That was the provision of the old covenant. Well, Jesus made a sacrifice and he put an end to all of those old covenant sacrifices. And so he dealt with the sin issue once and for all. Now he ushered in this new covenant, and in this new covenant, there is no provision for sacrifices for sin. You either receive what Christ has done, mm-hmm. or you're you're hopeless. There's, yeah. there's no other sacrifice that you could bring to the table that would bring about forgiveness of sins. That's pretty clear, isn't it? It is. Uh, so in this new covenant, you have to rest in the finished work of of Jesus Christ. Now, when we do, when we receive Christ, uh, the New Testament tells us this, in him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. So what do we have in Christ? According redemption, to, the forgiveness of sins. Redemption, the forgiveness of of sins. And what's that in accordance with? God's grace. The riches of God's grace. So have our sins been forgiven? Yes. Absolutely. Is there any longer a need for another sacrifice for sin? No. If there was a need for another sacrifice for sin, who would have to make it? Jesus. Jesus. He would have to shed his blood again. Is he going to do that? No. Absolutely not. So in light of this, How do we answer that question, what am I supposed to do when I sin? I think there's only one response, and that's to say thank you. Lord Jesus, thank you for shedding your blood to take away that sin once and for all. And I think it's important for us to say thank you to the Lord Jesus Christ and to recognize that that sin deserved death. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that like that sin was was just swept under the carpet or God ignored it or he winked at it. 
He looked at it. He saw it for what it was, and he judged it to the maximum extent of the law, and he issued the most severe punishment, yes. and that was death. And Jesus gladly stood in our place. He was the substitute. And so the punishment that had been directed toward us had been diverted. He took it. And, and so it's been dealt with. So I think it's important for us to say thank you to Jesus Christ for bearing the punishment for our sins, uh, because that's exactly what each and every sin that we commit deserves, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So how are we to respond? What am I supposed to do when I sin? Well, here's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to say thank you uh, to Jesus Christ for the grace that he's lavished on me that gave me forgiveness once and for all. Now, I know there's a lot of people out there uh, who are uh, raising their hands and saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, what about this verse? What about that verse? What about what I've been taught over here? And and here's here's the deal. We all have concerns like Barbara. What are we supposed to do? Isn't there something that we are supposed to do when sin occurs in our lives? Certainly this was the question that troubled my heart for many years. And as you know, I've shared a little bit of my story uh, through this particular study guide uh, I was left with two questions. How do I stop sinning? I never, I never figured out an answer to that for, for many, many years. And then because I couldn't stop sinning, I always wondered, well, what am I supposed to do when I sin? Mm-hmm. And I had a pretty elaborate formula. Uh, and, you know, every night I was, you know, at the same place, offering up the same prayer to God. Lord, yeah. here I am again. I've done the same thing again. And so I'm promising you again that tomorrow is going to be better. It's going to be different. So in the meantime, uh, please forgive me, and, and and let's let's kind of move on from this day. And and that's how that's how I went for many many years. And then I added to that because I never was sure that that God had heard my prayer or that He had a- actually answered with forgiveness. So then I started wondering, maybe God's not there anymore. Maybe God's left me. And so then I would add to that formula, and please come back into my life. So I must have prayed to receive Christ 500 times, you know, during those, <laughs> during those teenage years, uh, because that's what I thought I was supposed to do when I sinned. But what was driving that? And that's what we want to talk about next. I'm Bob Christopher, along with Richard Pfeiffer. We certainly welcome you to today's broadcast of Basic Gospel. We are studying through the Simple Gospel Simply Grace Study Guide. It's available to you on our website at basicgospel.net slash teaching. All the information is, is right there on how you can order both the study guide and a copy of Simple Gospel Simply Grace Uh, If you like the electronic version, Simple Gospel Simply Grace is on sale right now at Amazon and all retailers, online retailers, Mm -hmm. and the e-book is $1.99. So it's a great price. We encourage you to go to any one of those websites and pick that up for $1.99. If you want the study guide, you'll have to go to basicgospel.net. We're on Chapter 7 on page 50 in the study guide if you are joining along and uh, working through this with us. Um, And we want to continue. So Jesus has done all that he needs to do concerning the sin issue. Our sins have been judged. They've been condemned. They've been punished once and for all. There's nothing left to be done. As Jesus said, it is finished. Well, why is it so difficult for us to uh, accept that, for us to really rest in the fact that it's finished. Well, I think it's because we have this fear living inside of us. You know, when Adam and Eve sinned, uh, the very first response they had to God was to hide from him. Yes. And when they finally uh, started talking with God again, they said, we hid from you because we were afraid. Now, where did that fear come from? Well, that fear was a consequence of the sin, and it took root in their DNA, their spiritual DNA, and they passed that on to each and every one of us. So we come into this world 
afraid of God. There is a fear built into us. Now, when I was a kid, and one of the reasons that I prayed to the Lord, uh, please forgive me, uh, is uh, there was a period in my life that I got involved in a shoplifting gang. And uh, a bunch of 7th and 8th grade boys, we would go to convenience stores and uh, uh, drug stores and that sort of thing, and then we would just steal stuff, gum, matches. Uh, but our favorite item was banaca. It was a little breath freshener. Uh-huh. And that presented the biggest challenge because they usually had that right next to the cash reg- register. So we would go and steal banaca. Well, one night I was with my friend David, and uh, we, I was spending the night with him, and we went into one of those convenience stores, and we stole some banaca, and we also stole a lock. Well, we had great fun doing that. At least we thought we did. And uh, we went back to David's house, and the next morning uh, woke up, had breakfast. Mom came and picked me up, and uh, everything was just fine. I was ready for, you know, Saturday and then Sunday and all of that. Well, um, I forgot to take the lock that we had stolen and I left it in David's bedroom. So as moms do, they go up and, uh, clean up, straighten up and those sort of things. And David's mom found the lock. And so she asked David about it. Well, David was filled with guilt, just as I would have been. In David that. caved. He caved. He <laughs> caved. He 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 just was weak, and uh, and boy, he said, "Mom, mom, it's we stole it last night." And but it got worse because David didn't steal the lock; I did, and that came out. Boy, he really threw me under the bus. Well, you know how moms do; they talk, and so David's mom got on the phone and called my mom. And I don't know when that phone call uh, took place. All I knew was the following Monday, I'm out delivering papers. Now, that's the ironic thing. I was making money. I didn't need to steal anything. I could have bought the stuff. Um, But the challenge was was stealing it. So mom comes by uh, while I'm delivering papers, and she says, get in the car. I knew something was wrong. And I thought she was mad at me because I had skipped out of band practice. So I'm a truant and a a thief. Boy, was I a mess back in in those days. But mom said, uh, get in the car. I said, mom, it's a beautiful day. I just will finish the route and I'll be home. Get in the car. Like, no, mom. And finally she said, banaka. And I was done. I knew exactly why I was in trouble. And boy, did I feel the weight of guilt. I I knew mom and dad were so disappointed in me. I could hardly look them in the eye. And I went into my bedroom and I cried like a baby for days on end. And dad took me to every place and I confessed to everything that we did. And he took me to all these different stores and I had to stand before the manager and tell him what I did. And and dad said, whatever they want to do, whatever punishment they want to dole out, that's up to them and you're going to have to take it and boy talk about afraid i mean i just had myself in the detention center for the rest of my life never going to see the light of day again that's how my mind was was working but every one of them were merciful they were gracious and they just allowed me to pay for what i had stolen and that was good but there was this issue about god what is he going to do And I lived many years in fear that punishment was going to come at some point. And that fear was what was driving all of my prayers. That fear was what was driving all of my requests, all of my promises. I was so afraid that God was going to punish me that I was willing to do just about anything to stave that off. And that's where most people are. Fear is what's driving their relationships with God. That's why it's so vitally important for us to settle this issue, for us to say in our hearts that it is finished in exactly the same way that Jesus said it was finished at the cross. So let's get personal. Was there ever a time in your life when the fear of God's punishment overwhelmed you.
I just talked about my time. There were a lot of other things that were piled up on, you know, shoplifting and, you know, just all the temptations mm-hmm. that you go through as a young, uh, as a young teenage boy uh, in this world today and as a college guy and as a, uh, you know, single man after college. There's all kinds of temptations that you deal with, and as you give in to them, Just that fear of punishment seems to grow and expand and multiply and take over more and more parts of your thinking to the point you're overwhelmed with it. And that's when we can have anxious moments that that we walk on eggshells because we know, we know punishment is just around the corner. We might lose our jobs. We might, you know, one of our loved ones might get sick and die, and that's our fault. We've done something wrong, and that's the punishment. And we know we deserve it. That's exactly right. So we get personal with this question. Has there ever been a time in your life when the fear of God's punishment overwhelmed you? We've all been there, haven't we? have. It is part of the human uh, experience. Um, there's not a single person that has ever gone through life without having this fear jump up and really overwhelm them at one point or another. Lots of people try to hide that fear, uh, the pain of that fear, that haunting nature of the fear with alcohol and drugs. Uh, we blind ourselves to it. Um, we, we just... Uh, you know, close our eyes, try to sweep it under the carpet, busy ourselves with all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But there's a point in time where it surfaces and and it's so real, we have to do something with it. And I want you to look in your life today, go back to those times and, and look at the things that you were doing to try to assuage that fear, try to get it out of your life. And ask the question, did any of it work? None of it worked for me. I never got a clear answer. And from anything I did, any prayer that I prayed, that God had indeed answered my request for forgiveness. I never got a clear answer. I never felt forgiven in my relationship with God. notice how that fed the fear. Absolutely. Because now I'm convinced that he's chosen not to listen to me because I am so guilty. Right. Absolutely. So let's take a look at a powerful verse in 1 John chapter 4. And we're going to end our lesson on this particular verse. Here's how it reads. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Why are we so fearful in this world today? Because underneath we know we deserve punishment we know god punishes sin and we're just waiting for that shoe to fall we walk on eggshells we try to do everything that we can to get god on our side well if we will look at the cross we will see that god is on our side there god demonstrated his love for us and if we will grab hold of that love that was demonstrated for us we will see that it will drive out that fear. That's what this cross of Jesus is all about. He does not want you to respond to him in fear. He wants you to love him, to trust him, to have the freedom to go boldly into the throne of grace and find mercy and grace in your time of need. But you have to come to the point and finish this cross this forgiveness issue once and for all when you do just as i did in my life just as you have you have seen in your own life you will see this fear start to diminish you will see the perfect love of god driving it out piece by piece until you stand before god free confident and assured that god loves you yes Well, thank you for being a part of today's edition of Basic Gospel. We'll be back next Friday for another teaching edition in Chapter 7. We'll be back Monday for another live edition of Basic Gospel. So for Richard Pfeiffer, for Stephen, for Coleman, for Billy, for Michelle, for Vivian, for Kim, 
uh, for the entire Basic Gospel team. We thank you. We look forward to seeing you on Monday. Have a great weekend in the Lord Jesus.